Episode 11, 2010. The probability that we may fall in the struggle ought not to deter us from the support of a cause we believe to be just. It shall not deter me. Now, on Inside the Buffalo... Wait! Wait, wait, wait. Can't use that title. How about this? All right. Hello, everyone. It's that time once again for Down and Drought, your weekly walk down memory lane with the Buffalo Bills and their 17-year playoff absence. And Lord, forgive me for I've put the band back together again. I'm Prescott Rossi alongside me, Thad Brown, and a man who needs no introduction, Mr. John Kutchko. Thank you for joining us. This is more improbable than a Beatles reunion back in the heyday, <laughs> right? When everyone was wondering. But hey, anytime we could talk about the Bills, we're going to do that. Uh, you know that better mm -hmm. than anybody. Yeah. And even if we have to talk about these horrific years, it's always fun to be with you guys. And, and trying to figure out just how the hell a team goes 17 years without making the playoffs. We've been through one full decade. Now we turn to 2010. And oh man, there's a lot of things that happened in this year. And actually, it all starts the day before 2010 begins, December 31st, 2009. Buddy Nix promoted to GM from the college scouting director job. And so once again, the Bills go in-house for a major title in the organization. What was the thought, fellas, at that time of, all right, they're not going outside again and they're bringing in, not to be ageist or anything, but a 70-year-old to kind of be the face of the rebuild for the Bills. Well, this is only two years after Marv Levy, so they went young with this hire. I mean, <laughs> yeah, this, they this really did. I mean, <laughs> the, the, thing, the thing that I think was the overriding feeling was after having Marv Levy for a couple of years, who really shouldn't have had the job, and then Russ Brandon, who came out of marketing, at least now they're going back to getting a real legitimate like guy who can be a GM to be the GM. Whether it's a good choice or not remains to be seen, but at least it was a legit choice. Yeah, he, this was a football guy. This mm -hmm. is a guy that, you know, cut his leather on scouting. This is what he did best. So I remember we were covering that when they named him to this position. And at the time, didn't think it was so awful just for the reasons you stated. I mean, Marv Levy, who was out of touch when he got that job, and Russ Brandon, who was put in a very uncomfortable position by the owner, Ralph Wilson, who basically gave Russ the keys and said, figure it all out. You know, unprecedented power for a guy coming from a marketing background. So that was something. This was a, at the time, dare I say, a welcome change. <laughs> who knew what would come? Well, well, the thing that wasn't welcome about it, though, was it was New Year's Eve. Yeah. I remember you and I had this conversation <laughs> about, yes. are you kidding? Yeah. You know, why There have been a few of those over the years. But I mean, I think that was the only one we actually had a coaching change on a holiday. I yeah. remember we had this conversation like, yeah, I guess we're gonna have to go up again and we're gonna have to do this again on a New Year's Eve. Was it not like Christmas Eve? No, but we've talked a couple times about come on, you know, we <laughs> are always at DEF CON 2 around December into yes. January with this team. It's a tradition and you know that better than anybody. Mm -hmm. Big changes in the front office for the Buffalo mm -hmm. Bills. Here's Thad Brown. Thad. You know, we were stunned by a press conference announcement from the Bills today at noon and it turned out to be a pretty darn big deal. Seemed like there wouldn't be any real changes on the Bills next regime anytime soon, let alone any news before the new year. But that changed at high noon today. Bill's press conference. They hired a new general manager and John Kutchko hustled up to Orchard Park to see the Buddy Nix era begin in person. Anxious to put the last decade of miserable football behind them, the Bills called a last minute New Year's Eve press conference today here in Orchard Park to name a new GM in charge of football operations. 70 year old Buddy Nix, most recently a national scout for the team over the last 11 months. And before that, he had history with this team in the glory days back in the mid 90s. Now he'll be in charge of turning it all around. I'm not trying to build a resume, I'm not trying to leave a legacy. I'm just trying to help us win. Every decision that we make that I have anything to do with will be to help us win a game. I'm not looking for big names. I'm looking for somebody, as Buddy just said, that can get the job done. I think he can. Now, there's one caveat. I don't think it's going to come immediately. I'm excited to... to to be here at the time that we are. We got a great opportunity and, and I, I think it's a, a perfect timing. Obviously, it's important who we hire. The head coach, uh, this is a crucial uh, time for us. It's gonna take time to turn things around, but we're not that far away. We've got some good young players. If we get the right co head coach, under Buddy, and he gets the right assistant coaches, 
good teachers <coughs> were not that far away. From what I understand, Mr. Wilson said, you know what, we need to get top, let's go for it. And I don't know if I've ever heard that said before, but I think Mr. Wilson is 100% committed to doing whatever it takes to get a coach in here that's going to change his franchise around. Knicks will begin the new year with plenty to do. First on his list, hire a new head coach. He's already compiled the list of candidates and confessed he'll interview interim head coach Perry Fuel. In Orchard Park with the Bills, I'm John Kutchko. And yeah, it was one of those things like, uh, here we go again, you yeah. know, but it, it like it wasn't Christmas, but still, nonetheless, it cut into the plans a little bit. Nix yeah. was key in rebuilding the San Diego Chargers throughout the decade. He was uh, brought over with John Butler back yeah. at the start of the 2000s. So now here he comes back to Buffalo once again to be the team's general manager. And now they're in need of a head coach. And the coaching search for uh, the Buffalo Bills does not go well. No, no it does not go well uh, at the end of 2009. Here's just some of the names that were involved in the coaching search. Bill Cower was contacted by the Bills multiple times. He wants to stay at CBS. They interview Leslie Frazier. He goes to Minnesota. Brian Schottenheimer turns them down, doesn't even want to interview. He loves the Jets so much. Mm. The Jets, he's going to stay there as opposed to go to the Bills. Perry Fuel gets an interview. He goes to the New York Giants. Bobby April opts out of his contract. He doesn't want anything to do with the Bills. Jim Harbaugh decides, you know what? Stanford's pretty good. Yeah. I'm going to stay at Stanford. Uh, Mike Shanahan goes to Washington, and Russ Grimm stays with Arizona. So the Bills are left with Mr. Chan Gailey, who they hire on January 19th. The thoughts, uh, what was it like covering that coaching search, seeing one name after another either turn down or not want this Bill's job? It was, it was a joke in different ways. You know, the, the turn downs were one thing, but the other part of it was there was a lot of, wow, maybe Mike Shanahan, maybe Bill Cowher. There's a lot of flirtation with, let's maybe we'll get a big guy this time. And I think most of us in the media kind of rolled our eyes at like, sure you will. You know, sure this is what the Bills are going to get. Um, but at the end of the day, they ended up with whoever was left. And it spoke volumes as to what the league felt about the Bills at the time, the lack of stability as far as Ralph Wilson. I mean, he was aging, mm -hmm. clearly relinquishing control as the owner. To 90 it. going on 91. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and that was factored in big time. Uh, a lot of these folks just wanted nothing to be be part of this in any form because they didn't know what the future would hold. And they knew that Ralph was giving up all the controlling reins, which was a pretty substantial move considering up to that point he had his hands in the till and everything. And, and so this, these were very unsettled times for the future, not just the present, but the future of the franchise. It steered a lot of good candidates completely away. And John, I was going to say, what was your interactions like, you know, because we haven't had you on the show before, with, you know, with Ralph at this time, especially throughout the, the later years of his control with the team and, and also the guys that they had in control, guys like uh, Tom Donho, Malarkey, Jerron, throughout that 2000, that 10 year stretch where they didn't make the playoffs. Well, I'm trying to think that, and correct me, w when was Ralph inducted in the Hall of Fame, roughly? It was 09. Oh, yeah. 09. Okay, so we talked to Ralph and Canton, uh, you know, and, and clearly this was a guy that was. You know, you, we sometimes wondered if the Bills were doing the right thing, even putting him near a microphone mm -hmm. in front of a camera at this point. Yeah, even 10 right? years before that, right. we even thought that. that yeah, 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 some of those press conferences, there were some hints and so forth. So this was, you know, this was clearly a franchise in a lot of transition, not just because of the coaches or who you're bringing in to be the GM, but there were a lot of question marks as to who would be owning this team. Would they remain in Western New York? These were all very viable questions during this tumultuous time, no question. And this is the beginning of where we began to not see Ralph in the locker room ever. You you know, mm -hmm. 2000, 01, 02, through about, what, seven or eight. Yeah. You know, you would see Ralph come down. He would speak to reporters occasionally. He would be in the locker room. 09, 010 is when he started to pull away. And I think I have to go through the tapes. I want to say 11. 11 was, was the last time. Last time he was on the field. Yeah. 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 So, you know, at this point, you get the 2010 season. Ralph is the owner in literally name only. Yeah, which is unthinkable mm -hmm. when you think back to all the years plus where years. he would mm -hmm. be at every game and in, in, in crazy conditions often walking the field during pregame and yeah. bitter cold. I mean, clearly there was a sea change with Ralph Wilson. And again, I, I just think that had a lot to do with people saying we don't want a, any part of this mess. So the, the Chan Gailey hire, I, I mean, you know, it's a mediocre hire. It's a retread. It's whatever, you know, word you want to use to describe it. I, I would imagine then there really wasn't a whole lot of excitement or bells and whistles for Chan Gailey getting hired. No, we, we certainly knew he wasn't a good interview. I mean, we knew that right out of the gate. But, you know, I keep going back to you know, Jerry Jones after getting rid of Chan Gailey in after Dallas. Two seasons. Said, he had always said he regretted pulling the plug on Chan Gailey. So I thought that gave some people 
some people some hope. It certainly didn't give us any hope. We were like, you gotta be kidding me. The team has a new head coach. News 8 Sports Director John Kutchko joins us now with the latest from Orchard Park. What do you think? You John? know, I can tell you this. There's some buzzword around front offices around the NFL that this was a small stroke of genius by the Bills. I kid you not. <laughs> Chan Gailey is thought very highly of among some personnel really? in the NFL. And that's, you know, I find it hard to believe too, but it is what it is. That's what we're hearing. The Bills began a new chapter in their storied history today, hiring their fifth head coach in 10 years and hoping Chan Gailey is the guy that can get the job done. Thad Brown was in Orchard Park for the big announcement. As the Bills coaching search dragged on, it seemed like every update was about another name turning down this job. It made Buffalo look like the Siberia of the NFL. Well, today, Bills GM Buddy Nick said that 80% of what was reported was a, quote, complete fabrication. As for head coach Chan Gailey, he saw nothing wrong with coming to Buffalo. You look at the history of the Buffalo Bills, and I've come in that stadium enough times to know about the fans of the Bills Nation. Uh, uh, who wouldn't want to come here? I mean, maybe some guys have personal reasons they don't want to be here. Great. <laughs> I'm glad because I get to come here. Anybody we stand up here and present, there'll be some negative things. Obviously, we know that. I want you to know, with all due respect, I don't care. That don't bother me. My job is to get us the best guy to help us win games. And we found that guy. I can't say anything to change anybody's mind. All I can do is go try to help us win football games. If we win football games, everybody's mind will be changed, right? That's what will happen. Now, I will say this. There's a lot of sixth and seventh round draft choices that have become pro bowlers, right? It's what you do with the opportunity when you get it. I didn't want to go through a guy having to learn the NFL. There is no school for it. There is no internship. I don't care how long you've been an assistant. The day you become a head coach, you start learning how to be one. And before that, you don't know. There's two types of coaches, those who hope to win and those who expect to win. And I've been around enough winning and enough winning programs and enough winning organizations that when I walk on the field, I expect to win. I don't just hope to win, I expect to win. Nick said that Gailey met more criteria for what he was looking for in a head coach than he ever thought he could find, even if Gailey doesn't meet hardly any of the criteria fans were hoping for. Considering how tough a division the Bills now find themselves in, it's going to be a long time before we know if this hire was the right one. It was the only coaching introductory press conference I've been to where already it was you know, how does it feel to not be wanted in Buffalo? I mean, yeah. the first day. And le yeah. legitimately, those are questions to not just Gailey, but the Knicks Gailey combination. And Gailey said, look, if we win games in November, December, no one's going to care. So I thought he handled it well. Yeah. But yeah, this is a hire that got nobody excited, sold no tickets, you know, right off the bat. Bills fans certainly have seen these moments before, quite a few of them, when a new coach is brought out in front of the podium, says all the right things. Here's Corey Heppel. Well, we've been following what you're saying here on our website and on the Twitter and most of you seem a little bit upset that the Bills hired Chan Gailey and you're right you know Gailey doesn't have that sizzle factor of a Bill Cower or a Mike Shanahan and it kind of feels like we've heard this before our new head coach Greg Williams it's nothing like starting off with a little bit of pressure wow there's a couple of things I'm not compromising on I'm not and that's how hard we play okay attention to detail and how big the heart is. Our next head coach, Mike Malarkey. And there's just one goal I'm still short of, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna surround myself with a lot of people that believe in that same goal. The Buffalo Bills is Dick Geron. The only thing that I'll promise is I'll promise to do everything I can do to fulfill my part of this obligation to, to bring a winning team back to Buffalo. This guy is a guy to take us, get us back to winning and get us back where we want to go. Coach Chan Gailey. That when I walk on the field, I expect to win. I don't just hope to win, I expect to win. That's scary, huh? And then nine days later after that, we see a name come into our lives for the first time. Doug Whaley mm -hmm. is hired as the assistant general manager and the director of pro personnel after a long time with the Pittsburgh Steelers. And okay, you know, uh, Buddy Nix is 70 years old, Chan Gailey is 58 years old. Here comes a young gun with new ideas, a fresh face, to maybe put a, a, a different spin, a different voice in the Bills' front office moving forward. In, uh, right off the bat, he was looked at as possibly the future of the franchise from a management yeah. point of view. You know, it, it was not so much 
um, it, there's a date or Buddy Nix has, you know, he's only going to be here a year or two. But there was, from the moment Whaley came in, there was probably more excitement about Whaley, relatively, yeah. than there was about Nix Galey as a guy who came from a successful organization, who was young, who was up and coming, who could possibly down the road take over the reins of the Bills. And that's, and that's key. I mean, and that was true. I mean, this is a, a guy who gives him a fresh start. You know, he comes from, like you said, a, a fabulous program. Uh, the Steelers are one of the benchmark franchises in all of sports, not just the NFL. So he had that pedigree and brought a fresh set of eyes onto this, you know, aging front office, if you will. And it wasn't just with Buddy Nix. I mean, you had guys like Jim Overdorf and other guys there who had been negotiating contracts since a very long time. So this was a, a guy from outside of the organization, from a well-respected organization working for the Roonies and so forth coming to Orchard Park. There was a feel good vibe about that. I think we were excited about it when we first and then you hear him speak and he was very well spoken At the uh, time. And, and very energetic. And, and, and I, we I, I remember very distinctly us liking that move. You know, this, this, if, he, if he's going to be the future of the Bills front office, this might be a very good thing. Whaley fills the hole from the uh, recently fired John Guy who had been there for a long time with the Bills. And there are a lot of moves that the Bills have to make during free agency is you know, the roster is getting older and they announced February 27th that they will not re-sign Terrell Owens. So the T.O. experiment, the, they sold their tickets, they got Some, one year yeah, out of yeah, them yeah. and uh, was pretty productive considering he was 36 years old, 55 catches, 829 yards, five touchdowns. Um, just your interactions with T.O. and, you know, and looking back on that one year in Buffalo. He was a prima donna receiver, but not terrible to deal with. You know, I think really the, the most uncomfortable thing with T.O. is that occasionally he would do interviews in spandex pants and, and nothing else, like just a shirt. <laughs> and, and there was you no... Get the full T.O. Oh, experience. yeah, yeah. Like more and more of the experience that you really wanted. But other than that, he was, you know, a, a normal guy. He was a, look, a, a, a receiver at the back end who wanted one more check who, you know, occasionally he said, we stepped out of line, but for the most part was fine. And by the time we got to February 2010, you know, we were done with it. Everybody was done with it. Round one of the NFL Draft, April 22nd, they've switched to a three-day event for the NFL Draft now. C.J. Spiller, running back, uh, goes ninth overall to the Bills. 51 touchdowns in college with Clemson. 21 of them went for 50 yards or more. An explosive player. But this is one thing that we've seen, if you look at like a big picture of the Bills over the drought. Their inability to look at the direction the league is going and to see trends and figure out what to do when building the roster. And even though they don't even have to look outside their own locker room because they have a perfect example of why the running back position is devalued and you don't have to draft high for running backs. Because Fred Jackson, they signed him off the street mm -hmm. from Coe College and he is now starting over a former first round pick in Marshawn Lynch. And now they go back to the well again to draft a running back what was the response at that time to, really? They're drafting a running back in the first round again? Yeah. Well, that was the reaction. Mm -hmm. That yeah. was the reaction. And a guy who, as it turned out, had a hard time staying on the field, staying healthy. Uh, huge bust, in my view. It was an enormous bust. And like you said, we, the reaction you just had was, I think, the reaction we had Pretty on draft much. night. Yeah. And, you know, the thing about the drought, the Bills drafted all these running backs who really individually weren't. I mean, C.J. Spiller, I don't know if you, you call him a bust as a pick for the Bills he was because they didn't yeah. need him. Yeah. But he made some plays. He was electric yeah. for a while while he was healthy. Look at Willis McGahee, you know, Marshawn Lynch, um, Travis Henry. All these guys were productive backs to varying levels. But in every case, the Bills didn't need one almost yeah. every time. Yeah. Yeah. And this was another example of, think about in training camp, the Bills had <laughs> C.J. Spiller, Fred Jackson, Marshawn Lynch, and, and Joyke Bell. Joyke Bell was in camp with that team. I mean, they yeah. had they could have supplied an entire division of running backs all in one training camp, and they didn't really have much else on the roster. And th this was the Bills for a long period of time between, you know, 03 and 2013. Now, News 8 Sports with Thad Brown. Talking to Thad about the NFL draft, you know, their, their first pick, C.J. Spiller. I've heard comparisons like Reggie Bush from the Saints, who is mm -hmm. just Mr. Excitement to watch, can do just about anything. I think it's a very apt comparison. This is a guy that might be the fastest guy in the NFL once he gets into the league and they start clocking it and figuring it out. But C.J. Spiller for the Bills is the home run threat that they have not had really this entire right. decade of the no, 2000s right. when they have not been to the playoffs. Does one equal the other? We're going to find out. Fingers crossed. Yes, <laughs> cross them all. <laughs> CJ Spiller can't pass, he can't block, he cannot tackle, but you know what? He's fast. So fast that he was in Buffalo this afternoon, less than 24 hours after the Bills made the Clemson running back their first round draft pick. Corey Heppler was in Orchard Park as well for Spiller's Western New York welcome. 
Boy, C.J. Spiller already has a lot to live up to. Bills owner Ralph Wilson was here today to personally introduce Spiller as a guy who's going to turn around this losing franchise. For the last 10 years, and it's my fault, we've been a dull team, and it's with great honor, C.J., to present you with the number one number. It's the greatest introduction I've had. I know it'll be a you know, a lot of people, you know, expecting a lot of things. And, you know, my main thing is to go out there and just work hard. We've got a lot of great guys here. You know, we um, uh, want to get back to the old days. And, you know, that's reaching the Super Bowl. But it's not going to come easy. You know, you, uh, you got to be able to uh, fight with each other. You got to be able to have each other back. And, you know, I'm pretty sure uh, we will. Now, Spiller was asked if he felt any pressure because the Bills took him instead of maybe addressing some other needs. To that, Spiller said no. Pressure is when you're unprepared. In Orchard Park, I'm Corey Heppola. And you just look at that first round of the draft. And, and I know with hindsight, and we could do this with every year. Oh, they right. picked this guy instead of that they, guy. They but missed a lot of guys. They missed yeah. a lot. This 2010 <laughs> draft doesn't have a lot of quarterbacks. 12, 12 to 25 was a meaty part of that draft. Earl Thomas, Mike Ayupati, Marquise Pouncey, Des Bryant, all of them have been first team all pro. Mm -hmm. And the Bills take any of them, and you think, maybe they're not, we're not doing a drought. Almost yeah. all, except for maybe Des Bryant, are yeah. positions of desperate need. And that's yeah. the thing, yeah. at that time yeah. as well. And uh, when you, you play the, the hindsight game, oh, man, it gets even worse in the second round because the 41st pick uh, in the second round, defensive tackle out of Central Florida, Terrell Troop, mm -hmm. which, okay, in a vacuum, whatever. But the next pick at 42, Buffalo native Rob Gronkowski, tight end of the New England uh -oh. Patriots. <laughs> and especially <laughs> considering the Bills hadn't had a good tight end since – Reamers, Reamers Met, yep. Metzelars, maybe yeah, if yeah. you want to go back further. Uh, I know Gronkowski had a back, you know, issue at Arizona that that caused him to miss his entire t 2009 season. But man, now think of the marketing potential. Right? Like just just yeah. you know, Western New York guy, a blue collar guy, right from a blue collar family, and they just absolutely whiffed on that. I'll tell you what though, Rob Gronkowski in Buffalo with Trent Edwards throwing on the ball. Not first, they go to Fitz, and yeah, Fitz has yeah, been yeah. fine. But without the Patriots structure, without the championships, without Does, Tom Brady, yeah, yeah, with the allure right. of being the hometown god, you could see how that could have exploded sure. spectacularly. Absolutely. Quickly, well, you don't have you the know? structure of New England with right, right, right. Brady. Right. But yeah. Uh, Although I'd much rather have Gronk. Yeah, yeah I'd still, I'd still, I'd still rather no have Gronk than Terrell Troop. And, 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 and I, Troop had you know, medical issues that plagued his career, mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, you. He was a bad pick from the start. Yeah, it, 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 worse than Spiller. And especially because with Chan Gailey, he wants to bring in, uh, and, they're, and with George Edwards, they want to bring in a three-four defense. So they need mm -hmm. a nose tackle, you know, to go with Kyle Williams. But they surround him with just dreck. Right. I mean, it's yeah. it's uh, uh, I can't even remember who. Dwan uh, Edwards was. Yeah, Dwan Edwards. Yeah, Dwan Edwards and, yeah. and Marcus Stroud are, are the two guys flanking Kyle Williams. And, and even if the Bills, you know, say the Bills don't even look at Gronk. Linval Joseph goes 46 to the Giants. He's been a starter the entire time he's been to a Pro Bowl. Carlos Dunlap, mm -hmm. multiple Pro Bowls, goes to Cincinnati, pick 54. Just the Bills' inability to draft well. Mm -hmm. you know, we, year in and year out, every it's year. been a recurring problem, and it's set them back decades. It re, uh, literally. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. you know, there's a great video on YouTube of all the New York Jets draft blunders, and there's mm -hmm. a clip from, like, 1989 of Mel Kuyper sitting there, and he looks to the camera and he says, it's obvious to me right now that the Jets just don't understand what the draft's all about. <laughs> The Bills don't know what the yeah. draft is all about. Yeah. They Especially don't know what they're doing. In the first round for a, yeah. you know, top of the draft. Because you know, we talked about this last week, that, that Buddy Nix didn't do a bad job, not so much in this draft, but in other drafts with you know, picking up guys later in the draft. You know, he was yeah. a, the college scouting director prior, so he had a big hand in the draft. 08, 09, you know, picks third round through six are pretty solid. They even got some gems in this draft. Not a lot, but at the top of the draft, they just every single, I mean, Aaron Mabin, no. all the running backs. Yep. EJ Manuel later was a Knicks hand pick for sure. So all the things they've done wrong at the top of the draft, like Mike John Williams. Said, yeah, Mike Williams. <laughs> think, think yeah. Of the excitement. Oh, we all know. like Mike Williams. Yeah, I know, he's such a nice guy. I mean, yeah. Great interview. On on. J.P. Lossman. Yeah, I mean, you just go on and on. The third round, they take Alex Carrington with defensive end. Navarro Bowman goes to the 49ers. Mm -hmm. Like, there are all pro guys right. sitting in this draft. We've beaten this dead horse. Yeah. 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 In, in <laughs> hindsight, it's easy to do this, and we know that. You acknowledge yeah. that. And you could go through a lot of drafts with every team and see, well, they, they picked this guy, but then four picks later, they got – you know, someone else got but this a guy in the same all position. That's I, I the know, thing I know. That kills me. Their, their struggles with the draft in scouting personnel at the college level over a span of several years has been just well documented.
Training camp, we fast forward to August 4th. Uh, Aaron Schobel released by the Bills after nine seasons in Buffalo. Throughout the offseason, he's been going back and forth on whether or not he's going to retire, return to, to return to the Bills. Uh, he's second all-time in the Bills sack list with 78. Uh, and the Buddy Nick says they're going for the youth movement. They want to see more of what they have with Aaron Maven, which, ooh, man, that, mm -hmm. that's a quote that looks bad in hindsight. Um, but just, fellas, your, your thoughts on nine years of Aaron Schobel, who was uh, a very good, but I wouldn't say great player. He definitely had his moments. He had seasons with 10 sacks and more, uh, went to a couple Pro Bowls. Um, but, you know, he was not the Bruce Smith type no, or anything like no, that. Not no, even no, close. Not you know? even. Or even Takeo Spikes. And he didn't resonate with the fans yeah. a whole lot. I mean, this, this was a guy that was consistent and very solid. Uh, I think the fans liked him. They respected him. He was a blue-collar guy, a, like, a guy you would – see fitting in nicely with the Bills in in that town in that area with the fan base beyond that he, he did not really I mean this he was not a great interview he was very very soft-spoken uh, a solid player not a great player a solid player nothing like you know Smith or Spikes or anything no underappreciated no because of the era in which he played sure and because of the fact that he just never embraced the microphone and just right. didn't didn't you know could not at all bridge that gap to the fans to where they would want to you know bring him in and make him one of their own. Not like Phil Hansen did, right. you know, like Kyle Williams has mm -hmm. done. Yeah. Um, but a guy who probably will not get the credit he deserves for, you know, putting up numbers year after year after year. I mean, you think about all the bad picks we yeah. just talked about. This was a guy you can count on to at least provide pressure. On the flip side, though, never a guy defense or an offense had the game plan for, ever. You know, yep. he was, sure, you got to block him, you got to worry about him, he'd get sacks. But no one's thinking, well, we got to worry about Aaron Shovel first, then we'll run our game plan. And you think about the, the swagger kind of thing that you mentioned. Going from Spikes and Fletcher to yeah. a guy like uh, Aaron Schobel. I mean, it's just you're not going to get that buzz that you got from those two guys that no. were so integral to the defense at the start of the decade. And now we're also seeing in the drought guys that the Bills have drafted playing their entire careers with the Bills and never even really throughout the drought yeah. the playoffs. Yeah. Um, and, uh, other headlines from, uh, from training camp, Stevie Johnson beats out James Hardy for the number two wide receiver job. Trent Edwards named the starter over Fitz and Brian Brom. And then right on the, the eve of the season on cutdown day, James Hardy released. And uh, to bring it into 2017, you know, the tragic news of, out of Indiana that James Hardy has passed away, um, you know, was not, to be honest, was not a great pick, was uh, considered a bust. I mean, he's a second round pick with 10 receptions over his entire career uh, with the Bills, but just uh, thoughts on, on James Hardy. Just that he, like you said, he was a bust. I mean, as a football player, it was a, a pick gone bad. You know, it was an idea that you take somebody with 6'6", make him into a red zone threat, you know, a guy that could be, you know, a, a dangerous receiver all over the field. It never happened, in large part because of injuries. And I think, you know, when you talk about James Hardy and, and when the news of his passing broke, I started to think, wow, James Hardy, you know, I never really talked to him much. You know, because he was never healthy. He was never out there. You know, he was never someone that you would interact with because he was always in a training room or not available or not on the team or on an injury reserve. I can think, I, th I believe, maybe one time when we talked to him after a game yeah. that I can remember. Probably the Jacksonville game. We yeah, the game, game with touchdown. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think, and we, yeah, we were obviously there. So yeah. uh, that's the only time I can remember. Don't mo no, remember much about it. Just the uniqueness of going to get somebody for post-game sound that we hadn't gotten before. At least my, my, in my case. Mm -hmm. So so we turn to the start of the 2010 season. September 12th, the Bills host the Miami Dolphins. Trent Edwards is the starting quarterback. 18 of 34 for 139 yards. The, the long streak of Bills quarterbacks not throwing for 300 yards continues. Uh, he throws a touchdown. Spiller has 11 touches in this game between catches and receptions, uh, catches and carries uh, for 14 yards. So your first round pick, the number ninth overall pick, does not have a good debut. Uh, Bill's offense has 166 total yards of offense, nine first downs. Yikes. Yeah. Dolphins win 15-10, they're 0-1. Week two in Green Bay, Trent Edwards, 11 of 18 for 102 yards, no touchdowns, two interceptions, four sacks. There are a whole bunch of numbers here that just say it's how bad, bad this yeah. game was. Packers win 34-7. So after an 0-2 start, Monday, September 20th, Trent Edwards benched for Ryan Fitzpatrick. And I want to know, did you guys have a thought at that time of like, why didn't you go to fix it at the start? Why are you making this move now, considering that like you knew Trent Edwards was bad. Fitz isn't a le you know mm. an all pro or anything. But he's going to give you more than what Edwards has. And clearly, after the first two games, Edwards has nothing. I think the initial idea with a new coaching staff and a young quarterback that still hadn't been for sure identified as someone who couldn't play, I think any coaching staff, especially an offensive guy like Gailey, wants to come in and prove, hey, we can fix him. You know, this is, this is, we can make this guy work. And 
we already knew what Ryan Fitzpatrick was. He was already a retread veteran by then. And going with Fitz would just be a, a, a middling move. It wasn't an upward move. So I think the hope was they'd make Trent Edwards a quarterback. And I'm, there was some talk in training camp about changing quarterbacks. I don't think I ever took it seriously. I don't think we in the media really did either. No, I, I don't think. To we, be honest, like, uh, the quarterback, other than Trent Edwards, that got yeah. more play was Brian Brown yeah. more than Ryan Fitzpatrick. Yeah, absolutely. Everyone wanted to see what. I remember Thurman Thomas even said, yeah. I've talked to Brian Brown. I think he's really got something, which looks hilarious now. In hindsight, yeah. it does. Uh, yeah, I don't think we were stunned that Trent got the starting nod. Uh, look. Two years prior, was it two years prior when he had the concussion at Arizona? Yes, in 08. Um, up to that point, he had shown flashes of promise, okay? He has a concussion. I believe he comes back, plays that next game at home against San Diego, has good stats in that game, mm -hmm. and after that, he was never the same. Right. For whatever reason, something happened, He was, and there was a huge, huge difference from what we had seen pre-concussion to post-concussion. And but we weren't stunned that he was, I think, just for what you said. I mean, new, new coaching staff here, they, they think they can get this guy back to what they hoped he would be, it never happened. So after the Green Bay, I was in Green Bay when that, you know, an awful game. Uh, Matthews made his life miserable in that game. He got very little protection, if I remember uh, correctly, uh, at Lambeau. Four sacks. So yeah, yeah. He, he, I think Matthews had two of them at least. Um, so, that, you know, but to pull the plug two games into it, I was a little surprised because I was coming back from that game, and I believe you messaged me or, yeah. you know, and, and I was like, whoa, I, I did not think it would happen this quickly. <laughs> yeah, Week three, know. Fitz is a starter in New England, New England and yeah. uh, they put up points. I yeah. mean, the Patriots, they, yeah, I mean, they beat the Bills. We, right. we know what's going on here, but Fitz, 20 of 28, 247 yards, two touchdowns, two picks and a sack. Uh, Marshawn Lynch isn't really showing a whole lot, but 13 carries for 79 yards. Fred Jackson is kind of the odd man out in this game. C.J. Spiller has his first receiving touchdown. He has a kickoff return mm -hmm. for a touchdown in this one as well. Tom Brady throws three touchdowns. Whatever. Brady yeah. lost one. <laughs> one to Gronkowski. Uh, Fitz uh, has a 37-yard touchdown to Stevie Johnson. His very next throw is picked off, which ices the game. The Patriots win 38-30. But you think, okay, we, we may have something here in Ryan Fitzpatrick. And, uh, truly, he's better. Than, he's throwing for more yards in one game than Edwards did in two games combined. I think there was more... This is better than Sean Edwards, which isn't saying much, <laughs> but it was at least a step forward. The talk out of that game offensively was way more C.J. Spiller. You know, yeah. he runs the kickoff back, he scores two touchdowns. Now it's like, wow, the, you know, this electric weapon, this playmaker that everyone said, you know, would do things like this, just did things like this, and not only did it, but did it in Foxborough. So, yeah, the, the quarterback thing was better, but it was all <laughs> Spiller coming out of that game. Yeah, and we were feeling, as far as people covering the team, a little bit energized after that game. Yeah. I remember it well. Now, wasn't that... The next day the when next day, Edwards yeah. gets right. released. Yeah, yeah. And that, that press conference. So Trent Edwards gets released the Monday after that game. Yeah. And I remember standing there in, in the, the coach press conference when they make that announcement. And, you know, that was a jaw-drop moment. Now, look, Edwards was not a good quarterback. But not eight days ago, they were pumping him up as this is our guy, this is the solution. We captain spent of the team. All a training camp, you know, telling him about this is the guy, we're going to work with this, we're going to make this work. And then, you know, 15 days in the season, gone. Not just bench, but gone. Yeah. It, it, I can't remember a move like that ever again. I actually talked to Donald Jones a couple of summers ago about this, and he wrote a book about it. And in the book, he says that he was told, and the players, I don't know if he was told, but the players were aware or thought that that move was not a coaching decision. That move was made for management directed on down. I don't know if that means Ralph Wilson yeah. or Russ Brandon or more likely Buddy Nix, but according to Donald Jones's book about wow. his life, which is a great book, by the way, um, that move was not a Chan Gailey decision. That move was made above Chan Gailey. And, and Ryan Fitzpatrick is asked about it in the immediate aftermath of Trent Edwards getting released about, like, did you feel like there should have been more of a quarterback competition, at least during training camp? He goes, yeah, I did. Mm -hmm. I, he didn't think it was right that Edwards was pretty much guaranteed the starting job going into 2010 when he hadn't really done anything to prove it. Now Fitz has a better game, obviously, than Trent Edwards. Week four, the Bills host the New York Jets with Rex Ryan at the helm. Ladanian Tomlinson turns back the clock, oh, rushes man. for 133 yards and two touchdowns. Sean Green rushes for 117 yards. So the Bills' uh, defense, which was revamped to supposedly stop the run, gets yeah. gashed up. I think, I think LT had more yards rushing than Mark Sanchez had passing in that game. That's all you need to know about that game. There, there you go. <laughs> and they yeah. won by 24. Yeah, uh, the Bills had seven three and outs in that game. They win 38-14. So we see the, the real fits emerge in week four. Uh, Tuesday, October 5th, Marshawn Lynch is traded to Seattle for uh, a fourth rounder in 2011. Uh, Clearly, there is a log jam at the running back position because you have all these guys, some of them first rounders, uh, that are some are producing more than others. There aren't enough touches to go around. Um, the thought of uh, 
bailing on Marshawn Lynch mid-season and just a handful of years after drafting. At the time, I had no problem with it. You yeah, know, that because he, he was, wasn't the starter. Not only that, but he had been a problem off the field on multiple occasions. So it, this is this is a simple move. You have you have running backs. You know, regardless of your opinion of C.J. Spiller, at that point he had been a first-round pick. You commit to him. You know Fred Jackson is good. You don't in this era. The era of football is changing right about this time to where you don't need running backs. So, you, what, they got a fourth round pick for him, you said? Fourth in 2011 and a conditional in 2012. So, you got two picks for him. Yeah. I was perfectly fine with it. A lot of character issues, like you said, yeah. and they didn't need that headache. And we covered a lot of things off the field with him, and they, they just didn't need, it, need the headache. Move on. And that's what they did. And he wasn't who he was, as Mark Ludwig said yeah. a couple weeks ago. He wasn't Seattle Lynch in Buffalo no. in terms of a player on the field. So no, no beast mode with him right, right. when he was in Orchard Park at all. Well, he has unless the... he was behind the Porsche or some other thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That wasn't. Well, case. the beast mode touchdown uh, against New Orleans in the playoffs is this season, is later down the road. Um, but you know, you talked about like uh, a head coach wanting to like, oh, I can reach Trent Edwards. Was, did you ever get a sense that they tried to reach Marshawn Lynch and, and make him figure it out or to prop him up to to? Become what he becomes down the road. I don't think that I don't. Uh, this is complete, you know, guessing and speculating. But I don't think they ever tried to reach out to him. I think they kind of put him in and said, "Let's see what happens." And if he if he straightens out, then fine. If he functions with the team, that's fine. And he wasn't terrible that year. He did have the incident with uh, stealing twenty bucks from a woman yeah. allegedly <laughs> in a restaurant. But um, I, I think I don't think the coaches really tried to make that work. They weren't gonna, you know. They didn't, I don't think they wanted to get him out right from the start, but there were rumors of him wanting to be traded even before the season. So, Week 5, the Bills are 0-4. They host the Jacksonville Jaguars, their first blackout since 2006. There will be a handful more blackouts to come in this 2010 season. Uh, Fitz, 20-30 for uh, 220 yards, three touchdowns. Bills led 13-3, then get outscored 33-13. Jacksonville wins 36-26. Bills 0-5 for the first time since 1985. Week six, they go to the bye. Week seven, uh, they travel to Baltimore. And this game, you know, we've talked about how 2009, they were bad, but they were unwatchable. This team is bad, but their games are entertaining. This game was fun. I remember this game was yeah. super entertaining. I, I covered this game in Baltimore. And, you know, we've talked about this a, a little bit. The sideline, the sideline goals, what you're looking for. You know, you hope to get, you know, nice long plays right at you. You know, long passes, 20-yard passes where, you know, the, the throw is coming right at you. You can get the ball big and guys celebrate in front of you. I must have had seven <laughs> touchdowns like this in this game from both teams. I mean, Lee Evans had two. Stevie had two. I had Ravens touchdowns. This was, and a game goes to overtime, this was a great game. Forget about, you know, what the records are, who's going to the playoffs. This was just a fun football game to be on the sideline. My, my biggest memory, I think this is the year, and they, they all tend to meld together here all this season. So I'm having a hard time in some cases. <laughs> Recalling some of these games. Hopefully, we can uh, dust off some of the corners. Well, wasn't the internet in the press box just awful in that game? We tried to get our piece back in our post game <laughs> report. So we couldn't get it back. Yeah, and yeah. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me because we had a lot of highlights. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we were pulling our hair out trying to figure out what are we going to do? Evolution of the way our business is. You can now send things through the internet. And it wasn't working. I just remember being so mad because we had, <laughs> we had all had great this great stuff. video. Yeah. And he, he, you know, we go a long way back with this stuff, but we put a premium. I've always prided ourselves as having the best field level highlights, you know, in the region when it comes to the Bills. And we had a season full in this yes. game. And that may have been part of the problem. The file was too big. We couldn't get it back. <laughs> that may have been part of the problem. So we right. had to leave I there. Think you're right, yeah. We had to leave the press box and go somewhere else to get the stuff sent mean, back. I think we fed it from a restaurant or something. I think like so. Yeah. yeah. But that's what I remember most. <laughs> this is seven years ago. They were just starting with the whole internet and feed thing. Yeah. Well, you could send video yeah, files. Yeah. And yeah. I just remember, you know, because he was all geeked up because of all the highlights we had, which were, you know, you had a full season's worth by their standards in one game. Yeah. Every loss for the Bills this season has been frustrating, but none more so than the one here today in Baltimore in overtime, leaving a lot of the guys in the locker room stunned afterward. They competed. They learned how to play for four quarters, which we hadn't done yet. Um, but we didn't play smart, and we, we lost the game um, because we didn't execute in some situations where we could have executed and won the, won the ball game. A lot of guys made plays. Um, you know, we played very well in spots, but, uh, you know, it's tough when you, you know, sometimes it's not how many plays you make, it's the right plays you make. And, you know, today we didn't, we didn't make the right plays at key times. This is very disheartening, especially, you know, we were up, they came back, and we did what we had to do. We came back and got in the game, and, and to lose it the way we did, it just, you know, it definitely hurts, but 
just go back to the drawing board once again. Bills led 24 to 10 in the second quarter on touchdowns to Evans, Johnson and Evans. Ravens then score 17 points in a minute and 14 seconds to take the lead. Ryan Lindell has a field goal at the end of regulation, a 50 yarder to send it to overtime. <laughs> Ray Lewis strips the ball from Sean Nelson. Very controversial, but yes, it yes. was a yeah. yeah. The Bills had gotten a stop in overtime. They were moving the ball possibly towards a game winning field goal until the Ravens ripped the ball away from Sean Nelson and eventually ripped the game away too. I thought the play was over. Um, I, I didn't hear a whistle. I don't know if there was one or not, but I thought that the play was over. I was surprised when they came rolling out with the ball and holding it up. What they told me was uh, it was, you know, it was our guy carrying him, pushing him, and not theirs. So uh, I, I don't really know what it looks like to me. All I could see him just just being carried like down the field. So yeah, I mean, that's what I thought was going on, but, you know, I don't know. Nelson did not speak to the media after the game. It was the first contest of the year he was active for after serving a four-game drug suspension, and he had to think his season was not going to get any worse. The Ravens win 37-34 in overtime. The Bills are 0-6, but that is one heck of an entertaining football game. Uh, as Stevie Johnson has 158 yards. We are seeing a seventh-round pick blossom in front of our eyes. This guy is really taking off. Week eight, they go to Kansas City. This game is not entertaining no. at all. But overtime was weird. And it yeah. goes to overtime, 10-10. Ryan Suckup and Ryan Lindell, or uh, uh, yeah, Ryan and Ryan. Ryan Suckup and Ryan, Ryan Lindell, Lindell both miss field goals in overtime before Suckup uh, kicks the game winner with five seconds left. My favorite, memory, that one? my favorite memory from that game is that I was in a survivor pool, but it was a, <laughs> It's always comes back. It's always there. Yeah. It was a loser pool though. Oh, and, God. and remember, so you had to pick a team to, that wouldn't win. Um, and so the Bills at 0-6 at Kansas City, that's a money pick. You take yeah. the Bills. Yeah. Well, you get overtime, and all of a sudden, like, the Bills have a chance to win. <laughs> and then Kansas City misses, and you're thinking, well, if it's a tie, because I didn't have I had somebody else. So I wanted the Bills to win the game so bad. And I'm like, a tie works, too. And they're going back and forth. And I'm like, come on, maybe we get a tie. And after the last missed field goal, the Bills had a punt. Brian Mormon hit like a 20 yard punt that set up Kansas City on a short because if he hits him back to the five yard line like a minute to go, it would have been a tie. Yeah. But he sets up Kansas City like the 30 and they kick the winning field goal with five seconds. Only Thad like can know, have right? this yes. kind of recall. Yeah. Trust me. Yeah, just uh, only Thad. <laughs> only guy in the country that can have this kind of recall from a game seven years ago. Yeah. And that's a fact. Yeah, that is a fact. you see good fits and bad fits in just such quick bursts because Fitz has a game tying touchdown to Stevie Johnson late in that one and then throws a pick as they're trying to drive for the game-winning field goal like two minutes later to Eric Berry. Uh, Wednesday, November 3rd, the Bills make an acquisition. They hit the, uh, the waiver wire, and they claim Sean Merriman. Lights out out oh, of San man. Diego. The Bills in Toronto right now getting ready for a contest with the Bears tomorrow, but not the newest Bill. Sean Merriman arrived in Buffalo today. The linebacker won't play this week, but he says he's trying to jam down the playbook as fast as possible. Watching the Bills on film, Merriman wonders why they still haven't won a game. You see the guys and the talent that's on the field, and you kind of wonder, you know, how, how is this team, you know, 0-7? It doesn't look like an 0-7 team. Uh, and a lot of things they have going on defensively is, is, you know, some of the things I'm accustomed to doing and, uh, you know, just picking up the terminology and learn as fast as I can because as fast as I learn and uh, as fast as I get on the field. You know, to come and be a big part, of, of what we have going on here. Um, you know, they expect, they have high expectations of me to come in and make some things happen, and, uh, you know, I'm going to do that. He doesn't play the following weekend. In his first practice with the Bills, he pops his Achilles yeah. and is done for the year. Um, what was that week like? Just like, oh, man, Sean Merriman, a huge name who's had some trouble away from the field and, you know, steroids and all that stuff. And now, like, now he's on the Bills, and immediately he's out of the picture. I believe that was when the word Bills became an adjective, because that was when we first started <laughs> Billsing saying, real that's hard. the most Billsy thing ever. <laughs> yeah. That's the Billsiest thing ever, because it was. Yeah. I mean, they, you know, you, you grab a guy, maybe he can, you know, return to form and pick up some of that old glory. But no, he's hurt in like three days or whatever it was. <laughs> what and we he, liked about it is it broke up the monotony of just another garbage season. It gave us a really good lead because we always would lead the, the sports cast and sometimes the newscast, yeah. well, often the newscast back then yeah. with the Bill stories. But this was something, all right, this is something different. You know, we're not talking about a winless season. We got actually a star coming here. Yeah. And then in typical Bill's form, the way things had been going, he's done. And he's a good yeah. guy to deal with, too. Yeah. He's a good guy to talk to. I remember yeah. Yeah. yeah, he was a charismatic guy. Yeah, I, you know. Good so, things. So the Bills take their 0-7 record on the road north of the border for a home game against the Chicago Bears. Mm -hmm. And uh, Thad, you know, you've been to all of the Toronto regular season games. Actually, this, I've, I was, this is the only one I missed. All, oh, all about this excuse one. Yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, that's right. 
I was there. Yeah, yeah I was going to uh, say. I remember a lot of Chicago people were there, too. You know, after two straight crushing road losses in overtime for the Bills, they needed a game in front of their hometown fans at Ralph Wilson Stadium. Instead, they got a home game here at the Rogers Center, which after three years still doesn't feel like home. You know, you're seeing more Bears jerseys in the fans than you're seeing Buffalo Bills jerseys. And, uh, you know, it's almost like playing on the road when we come up here. And uh, we definitely need more support when we come up here. Guys have come out and cheer for us. I don't know if our fans from Buffalo really want to come up here and show the support because they actually want to keep the team. There were more Bears fans than I expected. I guess I could say that, but uh, you know, it was it was the venue we played in. You know, we don't have that 12th man. You know, when, when we're playing up here, you know. But you know, I understand the the, the business side of the sport. Yeah, it was it was really an eye-opener uh, that so many people would come in, you know, a three-day getaway from the Windy City, go to Toronto. Really couldn't believe it because I think they're a lot louder, obviously, than the Bills fans were, and I think there were more of them. It seemed that way anyway. Yeah, and uh, it, for sure as the Bills are, you know, 0-7, they're this, not going to... This game, I think, is a good example of how... Now, the Bills go 4-12 and this season and are good, but... Spoiler alert. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry about that. <laughs> but they probably weren't that bad. You know, first of all, I look at the schedule. They played nine playoff teams this year. Yeah. They only played, I think, six teams that are under 500. Think about the way the schedule works now. You can only play 12 playoff teams. That's the most you can get. And Bills got nine that season. And in this game, you know, they play the Bears pretty straight up. Bears were a good team this year. And um, they get hosed on Ryan Lindell having his first ever no good point after because it got blocked right back in his face. And then they end up chasing points, two point conversions. You know, this is a game they easily could have won. They had two overtime games we just talked about they could have won. So look, they weren't going to the playoffs, but four and 12 was probably the floor of what they were going to do this year. And this is an example of, of that season. Mm -hmm. Bill's led 19-14 in the fourth quarter. Fitz throws two interceptions. Well, uh, that, that's I mean. part of it. Too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you, know. you know, a week ago in Kansas City, head coach Chan Gailey spoke of getting this team over the hump. Well, once again, they were close. But once again, the result was the same. Feels like somebody kicked you in the stomach. And um, uh, I've got to continue to, to work to get us over the hump. And um, I hadn't done that yet. And they keep hurting more and more. But um, guys are still playing. I mean, Chan still has the locker room. He still has guys fighting and clawing and playing. And um, <laughs> we got we to get over the hump. You can either let it get to you. Or you can understand that we're close to winning football games and close to doing all the right things on the football field. And let's keep working and get this thing turned around to where, you know, we're a franchise that go out there and can win football games against anybody any weekend. We can't cave in. We can't uh, point fingers. Uh, at the end of the day, all we, have, all we can do is continue to work and stay together. I know it sounds very cliche, but, you know, that's the only thing that's going to help us to get through this, uh, this first half of the season. Uh, it sucks, man. Uh, it's... It's tough, you know, we, we out there, I mean, we're fighting, dude. Like, you can see it out there. It, it's, it's, I, you know, I don't know what to say. Like, it's just not happening at the end. But, I mean, I, I, lose, I lose a million, million games with these guys, you know what I'm saying, because there's no quitting this team. So the Bills are 0-8. It's their worst start since 1984 when they were 0-11 uh, under Kay Stevenson. And, John, you know, you, you were there for the Super Bowl era to cover – Teams going to the Super Bowl four straight times and now covering a team that's 0-8, albeit many years later. You know, oh. I, we've, we've shared many stories together in car rides and stuff, but just your thoughts of, man, I, when I started in this business, things were so good, and I, now I don't even know what I'm doing. Well, I started really covering them hardcore in 89, and even before that, 88, 87, when I was working at Elmira, Binghamton, was going to the home games, and they were exciting times. You know, Kelly breathed some life into the franchise, but I remember telling my wife after that fourth Super Bowl, because uh, we had some other things going on in the region, you know, around that time, uh, Ryder Cup, things were a lot. It was a good time to do sports in this in the region. And I just remember saying there's going to be a price to pay for all of this. Uh, you know, no team will ever go to four straight Super Bowls ever again. And granted, they lost them all. That's been well documented. But that will as great as New England's been. They haven't done that. And, and no team will ever do it now in the, in the day and age of free, agent, free agency. But I just remember saying there's going to be a bad payoff for this, a price to pay. And I never would have foreseen this at all. And at this point now, you're trying to justify to your family. Why are yeah. you going to cover these <laughs> yeah, games? Yeah, yeah. Not just the away games, but the home games. Yeah. I mean, uh, you mentioned blackouts because that was becoming a recurring theme for some of these as you get into November, December. And, and then you start asking yourself, I mean, at what point do viewers lose interest in the team? And the amazing thing is, and we've talked about this many times, as bad as that team was for so many years, 
the ratings, the TV viewership for the Buffalo Bills in December, November, late November, when they are out of it. Clearly this season they're out of it in end of September. The ratings were very good still. Yep. And so, you know, and that's what galvanized the masses around here. But it was becoming harder and harder to give up your weekends to yep. cover this garbage. And that's what it was. And especially, you know, 0 and 8 with a loss in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And you have that black cloud hanging over the franchise in this region of, you know, Ralph is now 91 years old and, you know, he's not going to live forever. What's the future of this team? And now they're playing games in the city where, you know, all signs are pointing that that's where they're going to go. At that time they were, yeah. yeah. And so there was a really bad vibe about that whole series and those trips going up there. You see a game like that where the Chicago fans seemingly outnumber the, the fans from Western New York and it was bad was getting worse in a hurry. Week 10, the Bills are now back home at Ralph Wilson Stadium uh, hosting the Detroit Lions. Fred Jackson, 25 carries for 133 yards, a touchdown and a receiving touchdown. Uh, not a, <laughs> by no means a good game, but uh, the Bills get a, a, a straight number yeah. in the win column. They beat the Detroit Lions 14 to 12. 10 straight games with a passing touchdown for Fitz. He's the first quarterback to do that since Drew Bledsoe in 2002. Uh, the, the reaction that I've read, that I've seen of just the, the guys feeling like they had clinched a playoff berth because yeah. they've won a football game. 0-16 oh, was definitely a point of discussion by then. I mean, I, you could not talk yeah. about it 0-8. Oh, and, and that day was, it was terrible. It rained the whole day. It was uh, um, just not a fun day to be outside watching football. And then the Bills led the whole game. Yep. And the Lions scored a touchdown with five seconds, 10 seconds to go. A 20 yard. 14, or yeah. Yeah, whatever it was. <laughs> it was still pretty unlikely. And uh, they get within two and then, you know, miss the two point conversion. So right to the very end, you're thinking, how are the Bills going to build this, build this up again? But, uh, and the funny thing was, the Lions came in with a 24 game road losing streak. So something had, it was one of those. Yeah. It, Some one, streaks entering exactly. today. Exactly. So it, we were, I think we were a little relieved that we were going to have to cover 0-16, you know, because if there had been bad, that would have been a whole new level of bad. Yeah, although there were some that were kind of like, this is, let's well, see if they, if they, run, right. they run the table in the opposite direction. <laughs> It'd be neat to see you did that once, right? You did everything else. You know, the Bills had the stigma of being the only team in the National Football League without a victory. They were the laughing stock of the league coming into this game here today against the Lions. But what happened here this afternoon erases all that. It's a win, and that's all that mattered. Hey, it feels good to get a win. Boy, damn, man, I see you. I'll give you some. Nobody wants to talk about the 800 pound monkey in the room, but you know, it was it was obvious. Uh, nobody likes to, that feeling, and uh, you want to win and get that over with, get that done with, and go on with your season. All the hard work that we put in, it finally paid off in a win. So uh, I think that's the that's the best part about it is everybody. We get to celebrate with our teammates for one time. And uh, it was great that it happened here at, at home. It's not like we're coming out to practice or during the week and we're not trying to put the work in or watching the extra film or getting there, getting the extra lifts and things. Like we're putting all that work in. And over the past four weeks, you know, if you ask anybody around National Football League and you turn that film on, you'll see the Buffalo Bills are better than the 0 and 8, 1 and 8 football team. We've been taking some really good football teams down on the wire. You know, we've been hitting them just as much as they've been hitting us, and we just hadn't made it happen at the end. Had a lot of different adversities to arise against us these first eight weeks and to, to be able to, to, to come out today and weather that storm, uh, figuratively and literally, you know, to, and still able to come out with a victory just makes it that much sweeter. We're hoping that this now uh, turns into the momentum shifter that we need just to get back on the right track. I knew it was going to happen. I mean, obviously, I'm excited. You know, we won a football game. But that being said, you know, we've got seven games left, and we got to, you know, they're trying to build something here, and we got to keep building. No team in the National Football League has ever lost the first eight and won the second eight. You know, and that's our goal. You know, and, and we're going to put it out there. That's our goal to win the last eight football games of the, of the year. So the Bills have, moving after that Detroit game, the Bills have had an entertaining game that resulted in a loss, that against Baltimore. Now week 11 in Cincinnati, an entertaining game that the Bills win. Bills led, or Bills trailed, excuse me, 28 to 7 in the first half. The Bills then score the following 42 of 45 points as they go on to win 49 31 over the Bengals. And it's not, not even close to the most entertaining games of the drought, but definitely this season. Wow, where did this one come from? Right. They come back and score all these points against Carson Palmer and not a great, but a good Bengals team. This is the Why So Serious game, though. I mean, this, it is. This, this is the yeah. Stevie Johnson coming sure out party. Is. So that, that was what this game will be remembered for. Mm -hmm. It was a fun game. It was a whole lot of good stuff for the Bills, but Stevie Johnson's coming out party was this game. The creator of chaos. It was. I sat that one out. I did not go to that. I think we sent Corey to that game. I, I, I must have been by himself. I, yeah, because I didn't go to that game No, either. no, no. It was Corey. 
and because uh, he got the money shot at the, uh, at the end there. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. On the so, home, home return. Yeah, I mean, this was all about Stevie Johnson that game. Mm. At that point, Stevie Johnson was on everyone's radar after that after that game. Former seventh round pick Stevie Johnson, eight receptions, 137 yards, and three touchdowns. You mentioned Drayton Florence. He has a 27-yard fumble return for a touchdown. Fitz throws for 316 yards. Oh. They did it! <laughs> After 59 games, the Bills have a quarterback that has thrown for 300 yards. The streak is over, and they're now 2-8. and eight. Now in Week 12, November 28th, the Pittsburgh Steelers come to Ralph Wilson Stadium. Steelers led 13-0. The Bills scored 13 straight points to tie. It was tied 16-16 going into overtime. And Thad, you were there on the field. You had a perfect angle of it. Walk me through that play. So, tie, tie game. And the Bills and the Steelers were really good. So this would have been a, a huge upset. And when you're on the field, one of the things about shooting a game on the field is that you're, when passes happen, while everyone up in the stand looks down, you're looking up, especially for the long ones, where the 50 yarders that go way up in the air. So Ryan Fitzpatrick about midfield drops back and cocks and just <laughs> lets it go. So I follow the ball up in the air. When you've got your eyes up here and everything down is below you, everything that's happening on the field, you really have no idea what's going on. You, you're kind of trying to use the eye that's off the camera to make sure no one's going to run you over. But a lot of what you're doing is trying to maybe judge on how the crowd is reacting. And never in my life have I shot a play where when the ball goes up, I so notice the crowd go crazy. From release point to up here, it goes from a low roar to like the Bills had already won the game. Very common in the Kelly days, by the way. Yeah, but he's yeah. right. I never covered yeah. that at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very, I had to throw so, that in there. So at this point, I'm up here, and, and I'm all over this play. But I can hear the crowd going crazy. So I know for a fact that whoever Fitz is thrown to is wide open, that it's going to be a walk-in touchdown. And I'm, I'm in, in that instant, I have a chance to process that, wow, they're going to win the game. That's pretty cool. I just don't blow it, OK? I can still remember seeing through my camera, him sitting, legs spread apart, head down, the photograph that became immortal for that season. Yeah. And, and what happened, just thinking, how can you blow this play? Because everybody in the building thought it was a touchdown up here. Yep. And then by here, it was one of the more, again, billsy plays in team history. Steve Johnson garnered all sorts of publicity for his antics on the field last weekend in Cincinnati. Unfortunately for him, he'll garner just as much attention for what he didn't do here today, which is catch the ball that would have given the Bills an overtime stunning win. It was, it was a great call. Um, it was something that we knew we can beat them on. You know, we ran in the last game, and I'm pretty sure they thought I was going to run it over. And I uh, came to the back of the end zone and had the game in my hands and then dropped it. And I said, you go through that whole game knowing you got a big team like the Pittsburgh Steelers. And then you got this kid coming up in the, in the NFL, you know, making plays. And all of a sudden, when the biggest play that needs to be made, you don't make it, you know? You feel bad. You de devastated right now. I mean, it was, you know, Stevie's the guy, uh, guy that, you know, we want. And we think he's our playmaker, you know, and we're in key situations. Uh, I'm going to throw the ball to Stevie, and this doesn't change anything, you know, now that we had one play that was incomplete. Bills head coach Chan Gailey didn't pin this loss solely on Johnson. It's just another example where this team hasn't learned to win yet. For us to get where we want to be as a football team, we have to go win those kind of games. You have to go win those games. And, um, you know, that's, uh, that's one of those if you're going to be the kind of championship team we're expecting to be. I got to do a better job of getting them to where we go win that game. With the loss, it now sends the Bills to a 2-9 and nine record, their fourth three-point loss since the bye week. Just when you think you've seen this team lose in every conceivable way, it only gets worse. In Orchard Park, I'm John Kutchko. That was the first year I got into photography, and as he's coming up the tunnel, tears coming down his face. I, I got a pretty good shot of that. And the next day, Stevie Johnson was on the front page headline of the Drudge Report. Explain why. And that's <laughs> yeah, it, 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 the, the box score simply says Fitzpatrick pass incomplete deep left intended <laughs> for Stevie Johnson. But oh man, it was so much more. <laughs> yeah. Because shortly after the game ends, Stevie Johnson takes to Twitter. It's 2010. Social media is all the buzz with the kids and their gadgets. He tweets, quote, I praise you 24 seven. It's, it's in all caps. And this is how you do me. You expect me to learn from this. How? I'll never forget this, ever. 
thanks though, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Pretty much the worst reaction you could have. You know, and, it, and yeah. we all get frustration, we all get, you know, You don't want to be mad online, yeah, yeah. because yeah. that's yeah. there forever. That, yeah. you know, and that <laughs> might have been, that would have been the, the education for us in Western New York about how <laughs> dumb things on Twitter can come back in your face and haunt you real quick. And of course, that was the next question to Stevie was, so, you know, you blaming God? Is that what the, the play is now? <laughs> and he apologized and walked it back. But it was, yeah, it was. It, it was, exploded. That yeah. was everywhere. Yeah. I mean, you were seeing news websites with having that as their lead, not just a drudge report, but major reputable news organizations that would have that in their top five Good headlines. Good Morning America was talking oh, about it. I mean, it, it was, was everywhere. Yeah. That yeah. was the, the first ever Bill's viral piece of, of internet. Yeah, stuff, it was probably, probably yeah. true. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, the and, Steelers. And the, thing, the other thing about it, too, is coming off the Why So Serious game. Yeah. He had kind of planted the seeds for being a viral sensation by, you know, making himself very popular that game and then turning right around and saying something totally dumb on Twitter. Yeah, he could carry the torch from Chad Ochocinco at that point in 2010. But, yeah, Steelers win 1916. Uh, Sean Sweezum has the game-winning field goal shortly after that, that Stevie drop. And, uh, you know, at this point, as the Bills are 2-9, are and nine, yeah, just, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's over. Yeah. And, 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 you know, the, the final four or five games of the season are... Really unmemorable. Adrian Peterson runs for, for three touchdowns on a sprained ankle. Mm -hmm. The Bills knock out Brett Favre, which basically ends his career in 2010. Um, but yeah, Arthur Motes tackle. Yeah, was, Arthur yeah. Motes hits Favre. Uh, McKe McKelvin has a fumble on a kickoff. As, uh, the Vikings win 38-14 to go uh, to drop the Bills to 2-10. And then and the final four games of the season, the Bills split them, go 2-2. Two and two. Um, If there's anything from those four games that stick out, Go ahead and jump in, so, but yeah. I, I can't imagine yeah. I can't imagine much. But Tuesday, December 14th, and I just wanted to get your opinion on this, John. Lee Evans placed on injured reserve uh, with a high ankle sprain. And uh, this is the last time we see Lee Evans in a Bills uniform because uh, he goes to Baltimore during the offseason. Um, Lee Evans, a guy who played his entire, well, his entire, during his entire time with Buffalo, was clearly a great wide receiver that had terrible quarterbacks yeah. throwing him the football. He bit his tongue a lot and was supportive of guys that, clearly were not on his level talent-wise. Uh, your interactions with Lee Evans and your thoughts on a guy that... Love Lee Evans. Had a, was just bad place to the bat at, the, at the wrong time. Yeah, I mean, he, he was a classy guy. Uh, the funny thing about him off the field in the locker room is he always began his post-game comments with, no doubt, no <laughs> doubt. And you could take anyone over the stretch of the number of years he played for the Bills, and he would answer the same question the same way, no doubt. But he was, like you said, he didn't have the quarterbacks. He had a lot of talent. He was a, he was a, a fun player to watch and a good guy to talk to. Uh, you know, very humble. I, I always enjoyed, you know, interviewing Lee Evans. He would always give you, once he got past a no doubt, reasonably <laughs> decent sound. And, uh, you know, you felt bad for a guy like that. Long before that, Eric Moulds. You know, guys, uh, Eric Moulds was a great, great wide receiver. And really, other than a couple years with Flutie in there and so forth, he never really saw the full potential because he didn't have a lot of good quarterbacks to work with. And Lee Evans certainly had the worst of the quarterbacks yeah. to work with. Yeah, Moulds at least had Flutie. <laughs> yeah. Stevie Johnson at least has Ryan Fitzpatrick, yeah. good Ryan Fitzpatrick for a few games, you know, whereas Evans had nobody. And, you know, we've talked about it before. Evans is the middle of the, the wide receiver progression of guys who the Bills have had who have been good to very good who have all been stand-up guys in the locker room. I mean, yeah. started, Eric Moulds never, almost never dodged a reporter. Lee Evans, I think, saw that, followed suit. Stevie was very good. And now Sammy Watkins, you know, not quite as much, but you know, still is a guy who you can count on to at least address issues in a locker room. And, you know, for all the problems the Bills have had, you know, a respectable, um, honorable wide receiver, top wide receiver, has never been one. Yeah. Okay, uh, the Bills end the season with, uh, with three blackouts. But their final, uh, their final home game, day after Christmas, against the New England Patriots. That game is sold out, so the game is on TV. But to, just to think of, you know, eight home games for the Bills in 2010. One of them is in Toronto. Three of them are blacked out. That is not a good sign for this franchise moving forward. And in that Week 16 game against the Patriots, Tom Brady throws three touchdowns. Ryan Fitzpatrick throws three picks. That's really all I have to say about that one. But the Patriots win, and now 15 straight losses against New England. Week 17, in, uh, in the Meadowlands against the Jets, Brian Brom starts. He throws three more interceptions. So the Bills end... 2010, four and 12, year one under Chan Gailey. And uh, just at this point, what was the discussions like thinking about this franchise moving forward of what are we doing here with this team? We're deep into drought at this point. Oh, you know, for we're, sure. We're, we're, oh, uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, we're, we're not only into drought, but in disbelieving. You know, yeah. I, I don't think there's any hope. No one thought, I mean, Ryan Fitzpatrick played better, but no one thought he was going to be the answer. No one thought Chan Gailey was the answer when he was hired. So th there was. You know, there might not have been an offseason where there was less hope than this one coming out of it. And, and it was, you know, we, I think we discussed it. There was a good possibility maybe they blow the whole thing up after that one season with Gailey. You know, they'd been known to pull the trigger, yeah, you know, yeah. early. 
And I think that was our concern at that point after that finale in the Meadowlands was we got to be on standby. You just don't know because you can't do worse than this. Now, News 8 Sports with Sports Director John Kuchko. Well, John, what did you think of the past season? Well, I enjoy covering the games. You know, <laughs> I we, totally passed the buck there, didn't I? <laughs> you did. You did. We are the only Rochester television yeah. station brave enough to, yeah. to go to these games. I and, saw and Corey on the sidelines Corey was, the Jets and you're going to see on... some of his footage. I mean, he got very intimate with some of those Jets players because the stuff came right at him, right in his lap. But, you know, I mean, I guess I, I'm disappointed in the way it ended. Who wouldn't be? You know, mm -hmm. after the bye week, you're expecting, you know, this team was competitive in most of their games against division-leading teams. And then the last two games against divisional mm, foes, they were awful. Mm -hmm. um, it's an uphill climb, a very steep climb for this football team. The Bills packing up. The stench of yet another losing season. A locker room cleanup day today in Orchard Park with lots to fix on one Bills drive. Players pack their belongings, their personal effects, as most all of them will leave for their off-season homes in different locales. Not the turbulence we had a year ago this time. No big coaching changes, but lots of holes to fill from another ugly season of Bills football. I think overall, as you look at the season, there were some real good things that came out of it. And I think some real good players and pieces that, that we found that we didn't know that uh, we had. But there's obviously a lot of work that needs to be done as well. And when you get into the off season, that's the time to evaluate all these things. I would like to stay. Yeah, I want to. I want to see this thing through. Um, I think we have something started, and I want to be a part of it when, when we start to become successful because I think that's right around the corner. Four and twelve record. You have the number three overall pick. There's a quarterback at Auburn named Cam Newton who looks pretty good. He wins a Heisman at a national championship. But, uh, yeah, Ralph is 91, going on 92, coming off a 4-12 and season. Fitz is okay. Your first-round pick, C.J. Spiller, has some explosive moments, but does not look like a guy worth the number nine overall pick at this point. Stevie Johnson has over 1,000 yards receiving, which is really impressive considering where they, they drafted him. But, yeah, uh, the defense that they revamped to try and stop the rush, 32nd in the NFL against the rush. So I mean, there was almost nothing to hang your hat on after yeah, that season. Yeah. Almost nothing. I was going to say, where does the, the 2010 season rank, you know, among the the, the years of the drought, uh, of like the most drought season? It's not it's not that bad because you have things. You have the Why So Serious game. You have the Stevie exactly, game. Yeah. The 0 and 8 start was something. You know, the Fitzpatrick. There were the things. The Baltimore game. The, yeah, yeah, you had the Trent Edwards dismissal. Yeah. I mean, there were things. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, but it's hard to, I mean, my God, you know how many seasons are going through that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, 05 was pretty bad. Yeah. The, the final year. I mean, you just think, final years of Greg Williams, final years of, uh, of Mike Malarkey, final year of Gerard. All three of those years were brutal. This is the first year and 4-12. and 12. I mean, this is the second worst record they have over the, the stretch of the drought. I think this, other than Greg Williams' first year when they were 3-13, and 13, th that was a worse year. This one felt worse because Greg Williams three and thirteen was two years removed from playoffs. All yeah. right, we're re restarting, you know, yeah. for whatever. This was, we're uh, we're not going anywhere. We're yeah. spinning our wheels, you know, and we're spinning our wheels coming off a four and twelve season with zero hope at quarterback and virtually, like I said, nothing to hang your head on. There's no climbing out of it, and that's what we were left with. And it was going to be a long off season, off season yet again. And who knew that years down the road they'd be yeah. still addressing the haven't been to the playoffs? But clearly. They were in the throes of a very, very historically bad stretch with maybe no end in sight anytime yeah. soon. You never know. Yeah. It's don't the Bills. That. You don't know. Uh, the Bills I hope have, it changes. The but. Bills have the number three overall pick in 2011. The last time they had a pick that high was Mike Williams. And yikes, that did not go very well. But, uh, John, as we put a bow on 2010, just your thoughts of... Uh, you know, of, of what we're doing, of this enterprise, of, of no, taking I think a look at I think every it's great. week, I, I actually, looking at a, a, a year of the Bills drought. You know, because it gives people out there, they see a different perspective. You know, silly little things like like I brought that Drudge Report. I mean, yeah. you know, when, well, and actually I believe there was a second time he made it with the missile comment. Wasn't yes. there? Oh, I thought you were going to talk about the right? butt cake. Was, no, <laughs> no, this was something <laughs> else. But, yeah, yeah, I can't yeah. remember I, specifics, I but, but, about. but anyway, I mean, as we look back on it, I, I remember just, you know, we were making the drives to Orchard Park, uh, that New England game. The finale was frigid, that game. The Brady had the three touchdowns. I think two to Gronk, I think. Mm -hmm. Two to Gronk. Oh, you're right, yeah. Um, but it was just bone-chilling cold and, you know, wondering, you know, and there were the fans still showing up. Now, the game was blacked out. We, you said that in the last three were, right? No, no, no. The, 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 the finale was not. The, the finale, finale was, was not, out. right. But the but they fact, three blackouts but the that, fact yeah. that they would still, a team that woefully bad would draw anything more than 10,000 
you know, that doesn't happen around the NFL. Yeah. It happens in Orchard Park. It happens in Western New York. And and I think a lot of those times we'd be, you know we'd be coming back and we'd still be sitting in traffic. And this team had been out of it for weeks. And it spoke volumes about the passion the fans have for this football team across the region. And, you know, there are no fans like the Bills fans. We know that. We know that better than anybody. And this was yet another example of it. You know, people still turn out to support the scene. Granted, that game, there are a lot of New England fans there. But, but you, you get the idea, though. And it was miserable that day. Because <laughs> I believe, now, again, didn't the Patriots spend the night in Rochester that night? Was that that year? I, was, I, I think it was because they had I issues thought, of the storm in Boston. I don't think it was that year because was I don't it? think it was Christmas time. I think it was early in the All season. Right. Yeah, this happened. is the day after Christmas. But, yeah. yeah. All right, man, maybe not, but that's another year. Yeah, it's another year. They, all, they, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. they all meld together. Yeah, a, a, a miserable game, um, a miserable season. Yeah, we'll call yeah. it what it is, a miserable season. But Bills have the number three overall pick. Maybe they make a, a good move. Maybe maybe year two under Chan Gailey turns out better. To that, we turn to the next episode of Down and Drop.